Welcome back to you, my fellow, uh, my loyal viewers, I should say. Thank you for continuing to follow me along in this story. This is episode 51 of my YouTube channel. This is a continuation of a series of videos I'm making focused on my life journey these last many months since early 2019. The focus of these videos has been my effort to advocate for a better healthcare system, both here in the state of Massachusetts and throughout the country. I have recounted in very thorough detail at times my life journey in the last many months from episode 45 to the present. So this episode is going to focus on my life history from January of this year until April. So as I recounted at the end of the last video, in January of this year, I returned to the state of Massachusetts after making a less than advisable round trip to the state of Arkansas to visit the cemetery where my late Aunt Carol is buried. Upon returning to the state of Massachusetts, I re-hospitalized myself because I still felt that something was fundamentally wrong. Besides the other things I was experiencing for many months, depression, anxiety, um, flashbacks, I was also having trouble with sleep generally, just becoming an insomniac in a sense. And so I obviously needed some significant help with what was happening to me. I was transported from Falmouth Hospital on Cape Cod and hospitalized at Westboro Behavioral Healthcare Hospital starting on January 19th of this year. That hospital was not a hospital that I chose to be sent to. That was the hospital that found the hospital transferred me to. And it was at this hospital, at Westboro Behavioral Healthcare Hospital, that I ultimately met a doctor who helped me get onto a genuine path of recovery and a chance to start my life again. When I was hospitalized there initially in January, I was feeling suicidal. I was terrified about what had been happening to me for months, and I was not getting the help that I had needed for many months. As I have recounted in earlier videos, I had been hospitalized many times from August of 2019 until that present time in January. As I have also recounted in a recent video, I believe one of the, one of the serious problems that we face in this country regarding the healthcare system is the effective and efficient transfer of medical information, medical histories, relevant data from one healthcare provider to another. One of the things that I think should be improved is the safety net, as it were, when people are so sick that they are suicidal and that they've lost their will to live. If someone is that sick, Expecting them to participate in a substantial way in the recovery of medical information from other providers such that a clear and thorough and unbroken string of events can be reconstructed to ensure better care. If that cannot happen, if providers cannot subsequently hand off information to the next provider to ensure that a person will get effective care, if that transmission of information is broken or ineffective or riddled with errors, that is a major risk factor for people to potentially regress in their health, whatever their health concern might be. And so I think one of the things that needs to be improved upon is the management, transmission, and review of medical data. And I think just the fact of what I experienced with Benfin Corporation is a testament to what can happen when medical information or other sensitive confidential information, like financial information, is disclosed in an irresponsible way to third parties who have no business knowing it. There needs to be an improvement in how patients are tracked throughout the healthcare system operating within the United States of America. If that tracking was better, there will be less risk of significant errors being made. So when I was hospitalized at Westboro Hospital, I don't know what my psychiatrist and the care team ultimately saw in my chart when I was first admitted. 
I know that they knew that I had been hospitalized some recently before that, but I don't know if they knew the full history, right? I don't know if they knew every single hospitalization that had happened since August of last year, of 2019. I don't know that to this day if they reviewed that and saw every hospitalization. I know that they were aware of some of them, but this is my point. Hospitals need to be able, hospitals and other healthcare providers, all healthcare providers, need to be able to transmit, review, and manage confidential, sensitive medical information in a timely, effective, and efficient way such that the opportunities for people to restore and maintain their health are enhanced as much as possible. So, I'm actually sucking on a lozenge this episode, so if I pause, it's because I'm moving it in my mouth. So, I was admitted to Westboro Hospital. I had the great fortune of meeting a doctor there that finally got it right. So, what happened? He administered a 200-question questionnaire to me, designed specifically to assess for a certain type of mental health disorder. I, to my recollection, have never in my entire life history had never taken this questionnaire before. Not when I was a teenager and I did Rorschach tests with a psychologist in Texas. Not in my 20s, 30s, and earlier 40s when I went to therapy many times. This particular diagnostic instrument was never administered to me earlier in my life. And what I find astounding is that this was missed so many times. So I took this questionnaire and the doctor came up with a new diagnosis. And looking back on my entire life history, it is a diagnosis that makes perfect sense. The psychiatrist that I met with in September of 2019 who diagnosed me as having bipolar disorder was, in fact, I believe, genuinely believe, wrong. The doctor that I saw at Westboro Hospital, the psychiatrist that treated me there, he diagnosed me as having borderline personality disorder. And looking back and thinking through the many times that I worked with providers in my life and the therapeutic work that I've done, that diagnosis makes incredible sense. And what's additionally interesting about this is that as recently as the beginning of 2019, when I had first moved to the state of Massachusetts, I was completing a class in abnormal psychology. And in that class, I was required, among other things, to guess what? Learn about personality disorders of which borderline personality disorder is one. So I actually had the knowledge in my head to, if I really had thought, I guess, more thoroughly, to have really kind of reviewed my life and thought, you know what? Some of these aspects of your life history kind of really align with what might be characteristic of people that have BPD, or borderline personality disorder. Hmm. And actually, when I was staying at that hotel in Pennsylvania before I drove back to Massachusetts in January, I remember thinking to myself, maybe I have borderline personality disorder. And so I looked it up and, and read about it and reminded myself of what I learned, and I thought, wow, I think I do have it. And my opinion that I maybe had it was part of what inspired me, pushed me to get myself hospitalized again, because I thought there was something like that may be going on. So, the psychiatrist tested me with this diagnostic instrument, came up with this new diagnosis. And here's the kicker, though. Here is what I find profound among the other things that I find profound, but even more so, very profound. I pretty much was unlikely to have ever gotten this test necessarily. Why? Because as I understand it from how the psychiatrist recounted it to me, the test he administered, this questionnaire, is not something that was insurance reimbursable. So he basically <laughs> did something for me that my insurance didn't cover. And so then it begs the question, 
if he had never done that test and taken time to score it and use the results to inform his diagnostic opinion, I, to this day, could still be walking around without a proper diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. I could still, to this day, be walking around incorrectly diagnosed. And so it's only because this doctor took time out of his own life and, to my understanding, scored the test, scored the questionnaire on his own time at home on the weekend and was willing to administer it despite the fact that insurance wouldn't reimburse for it. It's only because he went out of his way that I quite likely got this diagnosis correct. That's, that's, that seems to be the only way it would have happened. Now, granted, the therapist that I worked with when I was living on Cape Cod, he described to me once saying that he thought that I had traits, traits consistent with someone who would have borderline personality disorder. But that's not the same as saying that you're diagnosing a person with it. You can have traits of a certain personality, but that doesn't mean that you actually have a certain personality disorder. It's kind of not unlike saying you can be really, really, really angry one day or for a week or for a month or a period of your life, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have any diagnosable health condition in which anger is a predominant feature of that condition. So you can have traits of, traits of a certain condition or personality, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you actually have it. But still, to this day, I'm convinced that it's highly unlikely that I would have been diagnosed with it, with BPD, if I hadn't met this doctor. And so again, what this brings to mind, what I've already said in these videos, is that ineffable quality of luck. The doctor that I had at that hospital, at Westboro Behavioral Healthcare Hospital, he doesn't even practice there anymore. And so what if it had happened that everything had happened just a calendar year off, and I was going through what I went through last year at this time now, and I had ended up at Westboro Hospital in January of next year, and he wasn't there. Who knows what could have happened to me? This, this is my point. Part of my point is that healthcare outcomes in this country are suboptimal for many reasons. One of which is because it's too much contingent on luck. It's too much contingent on happening across paths with the right doctor. If I hadn't gotten hospitalized specifically at Westboro Hospital, who knows what would be happening in my life now? I have no idea. I, I might be out on the streets now. I might be dead. I, you know, th this, this is what's sad about America among many things, is that good things happening, I think, too often comes down to luck. Too often comes down to luck. And in a better world, it wouldn't be that way. Notice I didn't say an ideal world, because we all have aspirations for what our own ideal lives are, an ideal world. It's great to have that as the pinnacle, but it's more realistic and helpful to have a better world as the goal. And I remember, on that note, the psychiatrist treating me at Westboro Hospital on this topic of striving for better, basically, in a sense, advocating pursuit of realistic or achievable goals, not setting yourself up for failure by setting a goal that is not, uh, uh, that is not attainable. So basically saying, like, don't try to set a goal of never having negative thoughts again. That's not going to happen. How about setting a goal of acting on certain negative thoughts or expectations 50% less than you already do? What about reducing the amount of time and energy you spend in unhealthy habits? There's a concept behind this. There's a concept that I'm basically describing here. It's called harm reduction. It's recognizing that we won't necessarily ever succeed at helping some people to completely 100% stop a bad habit. You might never get certain people to stop smoking cigarettes for the rest of their lives. But maybe what you do is you reduce the harm by getting them to a level of behavior where they smoke 50% of what they do, or 75% of them. This doctor that I had, he was a skilled physician, and he was fairly young. He was in his 30s. 
So he was one of the best people that I've ever met in the field of medicine. One of the best that I've ever met, bar none. But it took me ending up in like seven hospitals to find him. It seems to have taken a lot of luck for me to have found him. And I believe we should have a better world than a world where luck rules so much of what happens. So much of it. So I was in Westboro Hospital for the longest I've ever been in a single hospital in my life. And during the time that I was in Westboro Hospital, something else tragic happened. You might be guessing. While I was still in the hospital, the COVID-19 pandemic began. And so the days of January 19th to early April of this year, which is when I was finally discharged, were some of the scariest of my life. The early days of my hospitalization were scary because I was still feeling very sick and unsure of what my future could be. And then by late February, as I continued to get better and better and better, I started to have hope again. The suicidal feelings went away. I started exercising. I had more energy. All of my indicators started going up and up and up. And then, in March, in early March, came the first inklings of the nightmare that it was about to start. And I am sure that on my dying day, one of the things I will probably remember or might flash back on, if it's true that people's lives flash before their eyes when they are dying, I don't think that I'll ever be able to forget some of the feelings that I had, some of the thoughts that I had in those days of March of 2020, when the world basically started to grind to a halt to deal with the very unusual circumstances of a global public health emergency manifest as a pandemic. As one way to pass the time when I was still in the hospital and getting bored, I started take, keeping track of the pandemic. I would gather as much information as I could about the pandemic, about the status of cases in Massachusetts, the number of cases in the country, in the world, and I would note it down I would do charts and graphs because I am excellent at mathematics and I would try to predict my future and have a sense of what might happen. So, <laughs> after surviving all the things that I have in my life and my early history and my adult history and then surviving seven hospitalizations or so, then I found myself still in a hospital ready to leave during a pandemic. And now, I'm going to share the last profound way that my past association with Benfin Corporation, my past employer, how it victimized me yet again. And this is important to listen to. When I was younger and I was going to school and I was working on my formal education, I took a lot of different courses. One of the classes that I took was economics. Now, I was not an economics major in college, and I didn't study it as my primary focus in graduate school. But I did learn economics because it was necessary to study public policy, which I completed a graduate degree in about nine years ago. Economics is a fascinating field. I, I find it much more fascinating now than when I first was learning it because I had never really been inspired to learn it because I had never really been required to study it. So, economics. There is a concept called monopoly. And monopolies can harm people because monopolies are something that happen when a business or industry accrues a, a large amount of power to dictate the terms of a relationship with the people it serves within very few hands, basically. When a company has a monopoly, 
they basically have so much market share, namely so much influence and power over a large majority of the people that would come to that company for a certain service or product that they can use their power to distort the market, to set terms that are favorable to them, even if it's actually harmful to the people that come to them for the product or service that they provide. I'll give you an example so you can understand better what a monopoly is in case it's very unfamiliar to you. If you think about sodas, the companies, the products that you're most likely to think of are the ones that are most popular. And what are the most popular? Coke, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Fanta, Sprite, 7-Up. These are soft drinks that are some of the largest, most well-known, and have large market share. If they work together to drive out all competition, and there's a name for that, and I forget what it is, if they work together and drive out all comp competition, they could create an effective monopoly. And a true monopoly, I would suspect, is when one company one provider of services is the only provider of that service where you live. So if there is only one cable company where you live, you have to accept their services if you want cable. When I was hospitalized at Westboro Hospital, and I was working with the care team to plan for what came next, I was dismayed to learn that one of the reasons they were having difficulty getting me a suitable discharge plan in place was because they were planning to discharge me back to Cape Cod. Now I should also tell you that I have, in the time since I was hospitalized, and actually during the time I was hospitalized, I was granted services through the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health by virtue of my need, I would say, my background. So I had new providers, new people to help me, and they have been of help, and they've also been a disappointment, but more on that later. But I learned from my primary, one of the primary people in my care team, I learned that they were having a hard time transferring me back to Cape Cod, which is where I had to be discharged to, since that was my, where my record of residence was and where I had been getting services through Department of Transitional Assistance. They had to transfer me back there, but they were having a problem because the, pro the main provider of group homes and residential services for people with mental health concerns was Venfin Corporation. So because Venfin has a large market share, last I heard, of the types of resources that I was being referred to, they couldn't refer me there. They couldn't set me up with Benfin as a provider of services because I had an existing past employment relationship with them that ended in a bad way, and I had a pending claim against them with the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. So, not only did I go through what I went through with Benfin as an employee, the difficulties with the co-workers, the apathy, the lack of being treated better, though I was giving the best that I could, the suspension, the investigations, the poor management of confidential information. Having gone through all of that, I still had to go through one last thing with them, unfortunately. Because they have, in a sense, a relative monopoly on Cape Cod, I ended up staying in the hospital longer than I might have because they were not going to discharge me to Benfin. It would have been a highly unrealistic, unhealthy thing to do. I wouldn't have accepted a referral to them because of the pending issue and because of my past history, and Venfin would not have been wise to have allowed me to stay in one of their facilities because they might have suspected that I would start trying to come up with more reasons to eventually go public and try to hurt them as a company, which is what I suspect they're going to now try to allege because of what I've shared in these videos. But that was a major problem. And until then, I had never in my own life felt like I had really personally experienced the harm that can come from a, from a monopoly. 
I play the game of Monopoly and I get the idea, but never in my life had I felt that my own life was being undermined in a significant way by the monopoly of a certain provider of a service or product. And so we get again, my future path forward was undermined and dragged backwards by Benfin, by their relative monopoly of services on Cape Cod. I might have gotten out of the hospital a month before I got out of it. So there's more time that I lost. Another batch of time, another group of sunrises and sunsets that instead of spending it out in the world, I spent in a hospital, waiting to find my way forward during a global pandemic. I was ultimately discharged from Westboro Behavioral Healthcare Hospital on April 3rd of this year. It has now been nearly eight months and I have not been to a hospital since. I am quite likely not in the best health shape of my life, broadly speaking, because I have fibromyalgia still from what I know and I have things that I have to deal with, but my mental health now is quite good compared to what it was. I have sought out additional care. I have resources now that I did not have before going through seven or so hospitals over a period that lasted about eight months. I feel more optimistic about my future than I did months ago. How optimistic I feel about the world is another matter. As I have said, I am recording these videos for a number of reasons. One, I want to see the state of Massachusetts improve its healthcare system because I personally need it to be better. Notice I'm not saying I want it to be better. I need the Massachusetts healthcare system to do better. If it had been doing better, I might not have lost months of my life. I might not have been in seven or so hospitals. I might have been a contributing member of society for months. I might not have been in a hospital when a pandemic started. I might have things in my life now that I have dreamed of for years that I don't have, but I do still dream of having. That is the toll that I, as one human being, have experienced because the healthcare system has not done as well as I fundamentally believe it could. I recognize there are many, many reasons why the healthcare system struggles. As I've noted in recent videos, I have done research on that, I have written about it, and I have spoken about it in my videos on this channel. So, I was fortunate to cross paths with this doctor. I'm not going to share his name because I don't believe it's necessary in a sense. But that is what I have journeyed through up until April of this year. So, for those of you who are watching this, who are inspired, that excites me to know that. For those of you who have more questions still about what I experienced, I invite you to continue to watch my channel. I invite you to reach out to me and get to know me as a person, because I am still seriously considering some role in the future where I would do what I can with my skills and my intelligence and my passion and my enthusiasm, do what I can to help realize a better healthcare system here in the state of Massachusetts. And in my current role that I now hold, I am working. In my current role, I actually am supporting the healthcare system in the state of Massachusetts. But I will not disclose who I work for at the present time because I am concerned about the potential for Benfin Corporation to try to retaliate against me for my decision to bring to light what I experienced during and after my time being an employee of their company. This is now the ending of this video. I will continue to record additional videos regarding my 
hopefully in a better healthcare system.